work. And we got a chance to go to a candy factory. But first, we're going to take a look at cassette tapes. Hey, this isn't cheese. This is a piece of plastic. Four, three, two, one, cue. Cue, David. Cue. These things sure have had a big impact on us, haven't they? When I saw my first compact audio cassette in the 60s, I muscled up all my book learning and said, I'll never get it good enough for music. So much for book learning. My mistake was in underestimating technology. Recorded music starts out as electric wiggles. And recording those wiggles on tape is done with electromagnetism. The tape itself is a formulation of ferrous material. Uh, ferrous meaning that it can be magnetized. It's glued onto a flexible plastic ribbon. Early tapes used ordinary rust as the ferrous material. The ribbon is passed by an electromagnet that looks like this, a metal semicircle with a coil of wire wound around it. Now at every instant, the small section of tape that's in the gap becomes part of a closed magnetic circuit. The electric wiggles produce a wiggling magnetic field that leaves a magnetized pattern on the passing tape. Now it's, it's pretty difficult to visualize the information on the tape. The textbook, wants you to imagine a whole mess of tiny bar magnets. Where the tape has no magnetism, the magnets point in random directions. Magnetizing the tape, more or less, arranges the directions, more or less. This gets confusing and messy, so I'm gonna stick to a more graphical format. Replaying the tape is a matter of reversing the process. This is a real tape head, by the way. Tape recorders are a little smoother. Now, there were two reasons I made my ill-fated prediction about music on cassettes. The first has to do with the gap in the head. As the wiggles pass the gap in, in playback, the, they introduce electrical wiggles in the coil of wire. Now, any wiggle that's smaller than the gap effectively disappears by canceling itself out. Small wiggles represent higher frequency sounds. And the classic way to record higher frequencies on a tape was to move the tape very fast, spread those wiggles out, it was 30 inches per second in studio machines and at least seven and a half inches per second in home recorders. The compact audio cassette was de designed to run at a pokey one and seven eighths inches per second. Now my other ill-founded quality concern had to do with the widths of the recorded tracks. The wider the track, the more magnetism there is to make more wiggling current. That means more signal, less noise. Studio machines used a full width track that was a quarter of an inch wide. The cassette not only used eighth inch wide tape, but it put four tracks, each one of them one thirty second of an inch wide, on that small tape. Four tracks. Now you see, stereo demands two parallel tracks. They're drawn on the tape by a double head. The cassette was designed to be flipped over, used in the other direction as well. There really is no other side of the tape. Now, from everything I knew about magnetic recording, getting a good signal from the cassette looked hopeless. No one told me that tape coatings and magnetic head technology was gonna improve a hundredfold. I guess I'm not on the right mailing lists. Cassettes still require extra steps in the manufacturing process compared to records, but that too has come a long way. The album is prepared by recording it on a one inch wide tape with four tracks. Two stereo tracks going forward and two going backwards. Exactly the same as they'll appear on the final cassette. The one inch tape is put on a special player and formed into an endless loop. The tape loop plays back over and over, and its contents are recorded onto big spools of eighth inch wide tape. The recordings are all done at 64 times normal speed. The eighth inch tape receives all four tracks simultaneously. Every time the big loop goes around once, a beep is put on the eighth inch tape. At normal play speed, the beep is only eight cycles per second, but you sometimes hear it as a low flutter at one end of a tape. There's also a quality control on some tapes. Here's where the tape meets the cassette. 
The cassettes are C-zeros, no tape inside, just a short plastic leader. The loading machine grabs the short loop of plastic leader and attaches the big spool to one end of it. The machine winds tape into the box until it hears the beep that tells it that one full album of songs has been installed. Then it attaches the end of the tape to the other dangling piece of leader. The cassette is finished and on its way to be printed, boxed, and labeled. Music to go. I think from now on, I'm going to stick to real safe predictions. They'll never get it good enough for video. Oh, yeah. OK. They'll never get it to cure the common cold. but somebody had to do it. The day dawned sunny and bright as we made our way to Nielsen's confectionery division to see candy bars made. Just another case of the Acme School working hard to bring you interesting pictures. If you study candy wrappers in the store, you'll discover that they're candy bars and chocolate bars. Chocolate has more milk and cocoa butter than chocolate flavored coating. From now on, we're gonna ignore the distinction and call it all chocolate. Much of the delight of chocolate has to do with its texture. These rollers are grinding the powdered ingredients to a small uniform size that will help the product melt in your mouth. Finer quality chocolate is ground into even smaller particles. From here, various fats and different forms of milk are added. In 1895, there were cows in the basement of this plant. Nowadays, milk arrives in trucks. There are several formulas of coating mixed here, as each bar has its own recipe. From this area, chocolate's pumped to the various parts of the plant. Another important ingredient in candy bars is, are, peanuts. Raw peanuts arrive in bags in the basement. Here, stones and sticks of wood that arrive with the peanuts are removed. The peanuts then whiz up to the fifth floor for the third degree. Even in bags of peanuts from the supermarket, there is the occasional rotten-tasting peanut. Now, if you make candy bars, you do not want that rotten-tasting peanut or a peanut-sized piece of wood to get into one of your bars. Here, the peanuts are being roasted. After the roaster, it's this machine. This machine has three outputs. One is peanuts, separated into their two halves. Another is peanut skins they go in the garbage. The third is that little round thing that's found at the end of every peanut. It's a little bitter, so it goes in the garbage too. Now, this machine. This machine inspects, as the production manager put it, each and every peanut. Peanuts flow in a single file past a sensor. Any alleged peanut that is not the exact color of a perfect peanut is kicked out. These people catch anything that the machine didn't. Each bar manufactured here has a special setup. Nougat, anyone? This is the malted milk bar line. Caramel goes on top here. Next, the enrober. Controlling the viscosity, gooiness, of the chocolate at every step is important. 
This particular mix is adjusted to take a unique swirl pattern from that final roller. Some bars require more steps. This production line is making the snack bar. The very same machinery makes the Mr. Big bar, but even though the steps are similar, slightly different recipes make the two bars unique. At the moment, it's making snack bars. Chocolate is a tricky substance. If you've ever put a melted bar into the fridge to make it go solid again, you've seen how the look of it can change. To give the chocolate a smooth, shiny, stable structure requires carefully planned heating and cooling throughout the entire process. These are cooling chambers. Nielsen also makes the Cadbury bars, and we were able to see a well-kept 50-year-old secret, how the caramels put into the caramel bar. And now, an Acme exclusive, how they fill the caramel bar. Gee, I thought we had some close-ups. Hmm. Well, the secret part happens kind of right over there. I was sure we took some close-ups. Oh, well, here's how they get the caramel bar into its wrapper. This is the crispy crunch department. We decided to follow the whole process so that you can make them at home if you want. First, you need a bunch of peanut butter. It's nice if you make it yourself. Now, whip up a batch of candy in a big copper and brass kettle. You can put some of the candy from the last batch in it if you like. Now you pull the candy. You'll need to get this attachment for your food processor. Okay, roll it out, separate into two pieces. One piece gets about 10 pounds of peanut butter. You'll need a big table for this next step. The stretching and folding process creates over 1,000 layers of candy and peanut butter. Now, fold this layered part into the other piece of pulled candy and feed it into the rolling, flattening, chopping, and enrobing machines. forget proper cooling so the chocolate surface will be shiny. We think once you've made your own crispy crunch bar, you'll find it's well worth all the trouble. Of course, the one you can buy from them is pretty good too. Over one million candy and chocolate bars are made here every day. Of course, the day we were there, half of their output was eaten by the crew. Just another tough day at work for the Acme School of Stuff. Finding out how something works is usually a simple process. You read the books, you look up the various scientific effects involved, make some personal observations. Microwave ovens have been a consumer product since the 60s, yet information on how they work is scarce. Rumors abound, misinformation exists. 
and the ovens seem a little magic. One of the first PR problems that microwave ovens have is that we have to use the word radiation. Now, this is not atomic radiation. It's electromagnetic radiation. Electromagnetic waves have two related aspects, frequency and wavelength. The higher the frequency, the shorter the wavelength. You can study this relationship sometime yourself by taking a toilet plunger into the bathtub with you. As you wiggle the plunger faster, the ripples you make are closer together. Now, the wavelength there is due to the speed of ripples in water. Electromagnetic wavelengths are due to the speed of ripples in space. That's 186,286 miles per second, speed of light. This is a chart, I made it myself. Uh, it shows the range of electromagnetic radiation. At the bottom end of the spectrum are radio waves. As you move up the spectrum, that's higher frequency, there's heat. It's also a form of electromagnetic radiation. Move up in frequency some more, visible light. Beyond, ultraviolet, x-rays, and I don't know what. Now, the crew's already gone to sleep, so I'm not going to dwell too much longer here. Just notice that radio, heat, and light are all the same electromagnetic effect. And the boundaries on this chart are arbitrary. Things that give off light also give off heat. And if you've seen an infrared photograph, you know that heat can be focused with a camera lens. Microwave ovens operate in the radio portion of the spectrum. It's expanded here. The names of the various radio bands are cute. We have very low frequency, low frequency, medium frequency, high frequency, very high frequency, ultra high frequency, super high frequency, and I guess extremely high frequency. Now remember the wavelengths get smaller as the frequency goes up. And with high, very high, ultra high, super and extremely, the radio spectrum is rapidly running out of ridiculous superlatives. So somewhere about in here, we start to call them microwaves. Here's a fast tour. Here's the AM radio band. At the middle of the band, the frequency is one megahertz. That's one million cycles per second. The wavelength's about 935 feet. Here's TV channel two, 54 million cycles per second, 218 inches. Here's the two meter band. Wavelength, two meters. That's about 80 inches. Frequency is about 150 million cycles per second. The C band communication satellites, those are the ones we all watch, are sitting around five gigahertz. That's five billion cycles per second. Microwave ovens sit at 2.45 gigahertz. Wavelength, about 4.8 inches, 12 centimeters if you're newfangled. Now, the various radio waves travel differently. AM radio will reflect between the Earth and the ionosphere and go right around the Earth. Television signals act more like light. They disappear over the horizon in 30 miles or so. The microwave energy in ovens acts a lot like light. And there's a further interesting property. It'll heat food. Now, microwave ovens heat mostly the liquid content of the food. That's why simple foods cook the best. Foods with wet and dry components mixed need special treatment. The microwave energy wiggles the molecules in the food directly. So the oven heats the food, not its container, or the air inside the oven. The wavelength of the energy is about four and a half inches. Now, aluminum foil's okay in there for shielding a chicken's wing from uh, cooking too fast. But you have to watch out for metal things like the metallic glazes on coffee mugs. Their diameter makes a darn good microwave antenna. Microwave ovens are extremely foolproof and safe, unless you do what I'm about to do. Now, you and I cannot disassemble a microwave oven and then use it again. This oven on top was provided by Sanyo with a complete understanding that we were going to take it apart. They're going to reassemble it and test it. Here's the source of microwaves. It's a strange cousin of the vacuum tube called a magnetron. My online encyclopedia came up with an excellent description of the magnetron, but the crew only allows me one physics lesson a day, so you're going to have to look up magnetron in your own encyclopedia. The oven proper, just a metal box that won't allow microwaves to escape. A fan over here blows air across the magnetron to cool it, and then that airstream is directed into the box and out of vents at the back. The airflow in the box does more than just remove the moisture from the heating food. It also runs the stirrer. Microwaves travel like light, and the stirrer fan is sort of like a mirror ball above a dance floor. It distributes the microwaves all over the box. Now, the great demonstration, I'm going to substitute a light bulb for the magnetron. That way you can get a glimpse of what the food feels. 
I had to put this box around it so that the airflow wouldn't get disturbed. It's a puzzle. It's a good puzzle. Now. The heating effect depends on the moisture content and the density of the food. So it's incorrect to say that they cook from the inside out. Anyone who's ever blasted a frozen pound of hamburger on high will attest to that fact. There really are no power levels in the microwave oven. The magnetron's either on or off. Setting the power level actually sets how long the magnetron will be on or off. This is half power. The magnetron's on half the time. At full power, the magnetron's on all the time. Cycling on and off is important to even heating, because with some foods, the magnetron will heat hot spots. The off time lets those hot spots heat the cooler spots. This is defrost timing. It's on pretty seldom, so that the warmth has a chance to thaw the interior of a lump without cooking the exterior. Now, my light bulb substitution isn't quite perfect. I couldn't quite mount the bulb exactly where the magnetron emits. And the fan and the interior of the box don't reflect light with the same efficiency that they reflect microwaves. Microwave distribution is much better. There is one classic dead spot inside every microwave oven I've tried. It's in the middle, right under the stirrer fan. Of course, right after the show, you'll, you'll probably read the instruction book that came with yours three years ago, huh? Coffee? Oh, in the next episode, we're going to look at sugar, butter, and milk. And we're going to look at how a telephone works, what a modem does, and go on my favorite field trip to a sewage treatment plant. <laughs>